In the second part of this training program, we are going to talk about dementia, how it affects older adults, why ongoing engagement in meaningful activities is important, and how to collect baseline information that provides a basis for selecting person-appropriate activities and programs. As before, keep the handouts for Part 2 in front of you and refer to them for additional ideas and suggestions. There are two main objectives for this part of the training program. The first objective is to be able to describe the relationship between individualized activities and behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, which we abbreviate as BPSD throughout this program. The second objective is for you to be able to describe how to select activities based on individualized needs, preferences, characteristics, and abilities. An important starting point is to think about what dementia is and how it affects people. Dementia involves multiple cognitive losses, and cognition is simply our ability to think and use information. Most people understand that dementia impairs memory, but they may not understand that dementia also disturbs the ability to speak and use language, purposeful movement, interpretation of sensory information, the things we see and hear, and the ability to plan and organize activities. When combined with loss of memory, these cognitive deficits cause a great deal of disability and distress to the person. Simple daily activities that most of us take for granted, like making a plan for the day, may not be possible because of the disease. Over the course of the disease, dementia robs people of their most basic abilities to think, talk, plan, organize, decide, and care for themselves. In addition to these losses, most people also experience non-cognitive symptoms. These behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, or BPSD, are very common. In fact, as many as 90% of people with dementia have BPSD at some time during their dementia. Please take a moment to look at the handout titled, Behavioral and Psychological Symptoms of Dementia. It lists some of the most common BPSD. As the list suggests, Many of these BPSD are disturbing to other people around the person with dementia. At the same time, all of these symptoms are considered treatable, and not just with psychotropic medicines. In fact, changing the environment, which includes what caregivers do and how they do it, is the first choice in treating BPSD. To help us understand how changing the environment can reduce or eliminate BPSD, we are going to review a model that will help explain the relationship between the person and his or her environment. The Need-Driven Dementia Compromised Behavior Model, or NDB for short, was designed to help researchers and care providers think about how the person with dementia and the environment interact to cause behavioral and psychological symptoms. The models help us to understand that behaviors rarely come out of nowhere. Instead, they are a form of communication, the way the person with dementia tells us that they need something. The point is that caregivers can learn to listen to the behavior and adjust the environment to help the person meet their needs and be comfortable. The NDB model has two main parts, which are shown on the slide and in your handout. Need-Driven Dementia Compromised Model of Care. As suggested by the arrows in the model, each of the two parts directly contributes to behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, and each part interacts with the other to contribute to BPSD. On the left side, there are background factors, which include things that are unique to this individual. On the right side of the model are proximal factors, which just means things that are near to the person and likely to influence him or her. Individual or background factors are relatively stable and unlikely to change much over time. Again, individual factors include dementia-related losses, physical health problems that occur along with the dementia, and long-standing personality traits and coping methods. Dementia-related losses will likely progress over time, meaning that the person will have more difficulty functioning and be more reliant on caregivers for assistance, support, and direction. These individual factors definitely contribute to the development of BPSD, but there isn't much we can do to treat them. Once the person has lost the ability, whether it is the use of language or the ability to put their clothes on in the right order, that ability is gone. Similarly, a person who has been an outgoing person will likely continue to be that way. 
We need to take these things into consideration when we think about BPSD, but we won't likely to change them. Instead, we want to focus on these proximal factors, things in the environment that are constantly changing over time. By adapting the environment, caregivers are able to reduce BPSD and help the person with dementia function as well as they can. To do that, we need to assess the person and situation on a regular basis. As noted in the NDB handout, there are lots of factors to consider in the personal, social, and physical environment. For example, is pain the reason they grab your arm when you are trying to dress them? Is there too much going on at once in their social environment? Is the combination of meals being served, medications being given, and visitors too much for the person? How about the physical environment? Is the man in the bathroom really their own reflection in the mirror? Additional information about factors that cause and contribute to BPSD can be found in your handout titled Common Antecedents to BPSD. The point is that the environment can have a huge influence on the behavioral and psychological symptoms that the person has, and we often can change those factors. As we think about the environment, an important consideration is the type and frequency of activities in which the person with dementia is engaged. In too many instances, people with dementia are left alone, often with nothing to do. The losses that are part of dementia, like using language to explain needs or to plan their day, interfere with doing things on their own. Often they wander aimlessly out of boredom or cry out for company or comfort. We can reduce the risk that behavioral symptoms occur in the first place by helping the person with dementia engage in meaningful, person-appropriate activities. As noted in the handout titled, Factors to Consider in Planning Person-Appropriate Activities, the type of activity we select will depend on the person's needs at the time. We will want to think about the person's background factors, the things that are reasonably stable. For example, the extent of their cognitive impairment and their retained abilities, physical limitations that are a result of their health problems, and of course their long-standing personality traits and habits. All of these things interact with environmental factors and need to be considered. We will also need to think about all the environmental factors at that time. That includes the person's level of physical and psychological comfort and things that are going on or maybe not going on in both the social and physical environment. Providing high-quality dementia care often requires that caregivers take a step back and think hard about who the person is. Forget the behavioral symptoms and the loss of ability or dependency for a minute and just ask yourself, who is this person as a human being? What needs or feelings do they have? In some cases, caregivers begin to think about the person with dementia as just a series of problem behaviors and forget that this is a person who has a long history of relationships with other people, who worked and had roles in their family and community, and engaged in a variety of pastimes or hobbies at different points in life. For most, life was full of joys and challenges, but we don't get to know about that part. We only see an older person who can't remember what to do, and who sometimes is difficult to care for because of their loss of ability. In order to really individualize activities and make them person-appropriate for those with dementia, caregivers need to know the person well. As shown on the slide, several important things interact and need to be considered in selected individualized activities for persons with dementia. The person's activity interests and preferences, their cognitive level, their physical abilities and or limitations, any psychiatric problems or symptoms that they might have, and their communication abilities. And of course, all of these things take place in an environment that is changing all the time. Although it may seem like a lot to know, most of this information is easy to either find in the chart or assess using a simple scale or tool. In fact, much of the required information is part of the Minimum Data Set, or MDS. One such tool from the MDS is the Preferences for Customary Routine and Activities, which can be found in your handouts. Each team member will likely have a different role in conducting assessments. At the same time, everyone needs to have a basic understanding of the person's abilities, interests, and needs. Let's think about how to approach this fact-finding mission now. We recommend that you use the Farrington Leisure Interests Inventory form to gather information about the older person's past and present interests. A copy of this form is included in your handouts. This assessment also includes talking to family members to get their input and ideas about what the person may have enjoyed, but is unable to recall and tell us about. Because memory loss is the hallmark of dementia, 
We always need to think about ways to get information that the person is not able to tell us, him, or herself. Family members are great resources and really should be our partners in all aspects of care. The diagnosis of dementia means that the person has problems with memory and other cognitive functions. But the amount of loss and disability caused by dementia will vary from person to person and with this the same person over a period of time. Knowing how impaired the person is will help guide what type and how complicated individualized activities should be. For example, activities that work well for higher functioning people with dementia will likely need to be adapted for those who are lower functioning. In other cases, you may want to use an entirely different type of approach, based on the person's retained abilities and needs. The Mini Mental State Exam, or MMSE, is a 30-point scale that is often used to assess cognitive abilities in dementia. The scale score may be used to estimate the person's level of cognitive function. This information is often part of the existing medical record or chart. The Brief Interview for Mental Status, or BIMS, which is embedded in the MDS, is another assessment tool used to evaluate aspects of cognition, including attention, orientation, and ability to recall new information. Information about both the MMSE and the BIMS are included in your handouts. We also need to think about any physical health problems that will affect the person's ability to participate in activities. Like other older adults, people with dementia are likely to have one or more physical health problems that may interfere with day-to-day -day activities. For example, some may have heart disease that contributes to fatigue. Others may have problems with walking and movement. Pain associated with physical health problems is a big consideration. In short, knowing what limitations and abilities the person has will be important in developing activity choices and adapting activities to meet current abilities. Psychiatric problems are another important consideration, particularly depression. We recommend the Patient Health Questionnaire, or PHQ-9, Scale for Assessing Depression, which is in your handouts. There are nine problems that match the symptoms of major depression, and each is rated from not at all to nearly every day. The first symptom on the scale, having little interest or pleasure in doing things, is one of the hallmarks of depression. Depression literally robs people of their ability to enjoy things that normally are pleasant and fun. Many times this loss of ability to feel pleasure is accompanied by feeling tired and loss of energy. The person withdraws, becomes apathetic and indifferent, and just can't seem to get going to do anything enjoyable. In turn, both the activities selected and the approach used need to match the person's needs. As you recall, the ability to use language is one of the losses that occurs as a part of dementia. Over a period of time, the person's ability to find the right word starts to decline. Word substitutions, like calling a familiar object a whatchamacallit, may occur, making it difficult to follow the person's thought process. The ability to put together meaningful sentences and respond to questions also declines. The person may seem to talk nonsense, meaning that they may say things that don't fit with what was said to them, or what is going on around them. In short, their ability to communicate needs, wants, and preferences deteriorates as the dementia progresses. And like other losses in dementia, there is a lot of variability between people. In summary, caregivers can use this base of background information, activity interests and preferences, cognitive level, physical abilities, psychiatric problems, and communication abilities to match individualized and meaningful activities to the current needs of persons with dementia. Going back to the NDB model, caregivers also need to think about proximal or individual factors that relate to the ever-changing environment. A long list of physical and emotional sensations and feelings may need to be considered. Physical sensations like hunger, pain, and fatigue may need to be addressed before a program. Being physically and emotionally comfortable is essential to engaging the person with dementia in any activity, whether that is daily care or leisure interests. The same thing is true for the social and physical environment. If there are too many people or demands for performance that are confusing or frustrating, the potential success of individualized activities is reduced. 
Likewise, distracting or confusing noises or objects in the environment are likely to pull the person off track and interfere with meaningful activity engagement. As the NDB model of care suggests, many of the behaviors we label as being problems are the result of unmet physical, emotional, and social needs. Taking a minute to think about common patterns can be very helpful in replacing problem patterns with more positive and engaged behaviors. For example, what time of day does the behavior occur? Where does it occur? What is going on around the person? In short, we can often reduce challenging behaviors by meeting unmet needs and adding something pleasurable to do as an alternative. The information you collect about the person and his or her abilities, daily patterns, and unmet needs will help you tailor activities to that person. Instead of offering one-size-fits-all programs, you'll be thinking about this unique individual and what fits best. Just like a tailor sews clothing to best fit a person, caregivers could tailor activities to the individual's needs, preferences, characteristics, and abilities. As before, stop and think about what the behavior may represent, whether that is agitation or apathy. Be sure to consider the time of day that different types of behaviors occur, and remember that the same person can be agitated and apathetic in the same day. Needs tend to vary over the course of the day, evening, and night, so knowing those patterns is really important. We also need to ask the person and his or her family about personal preferences for activities. Instead of assuming the person is unable to express their wishes and desires, try asking them. As before, using a leisure interest scale like the Farrington often helps cue the person to think about activities that they enjoy. Knowing long-standing habits and preferences is also essential. The person who never enjoyed large groups, or who is known to have avoided certain types of activities, is unlikely to want to do those things now. Using long-standing characteristics as a guide doesn't mean that we shouldn't try new things. People with dementia are people, and often have unexplored interests and abilities. For example, some may enjoy painting or other artistic activities, even though they did not actively pursue that interest as an adult. And of course, we constantly need to think about how the activity, no matter what it is, is individualized to the person with dementia. Offering things that are too complex or difficult is destined to be a failure. And at the same time, offering programs that are overly simple can be insulting to the person who is higher functioning. Like anyone else, the person with dementia deserves an opportunity to be successful. In being successful, they feel pleasure, greater self-confidence and self-worth, and a sense of mastery the ability to achieve something. As shown on the slide, there are many activity choices for persons with dementia. In part three of this training program, we will talk about some of these choices and provide specific examples of how they might be used in practice. For now, try to remember that an activity is not just an activity. Often it is the application of the activity that makes the difference in its meaning and purpose. Let's take music as an example. Music may be used to calm and relax a person who is restless and pacing. In other instances, our goal may be to get the person going, to activate them when they are apathetic and withdrawn. The point is that music is the medium, the activity, in both cases. But the application changes the effect on the person with dementia. So caregivers really need to think about the outcome they desire and be specific about the approach or application of the activity. Using global terms like music therapy isn't really helpful. We need the details of how and when the activity is used. Successful outcomes really rely on the contributions of each and every team member. No one person can do it alone. In fact, that is one of the primary messages in the CMS regulations related to activity. Time and time again, research and practice have shown that it takes a full team to promote function and comfort for persons with dementia in long-term care settings. Each team member has a role in helping the person with dementia be involved in person-appropriate activities. Whether you are the nurse, nursing assistant, social worker, part of the activity and recreational therapy team, an occupational, physical, or speech therapist, or working in the dietary, housekeeping, or administrative department of the facility. Some team members take more active roles, but everyone has a responsibility to understand what dementia is and how individual needs and interests, environmental factors, care routines, 
and approaches and baseline assessments may be used to guide the development of person-appropriate, individualized activities. In summary, the behavioral and psychological symptoms that regularly accompany dementia are highly treatable, but caregivers must know the person with dementia well in order to develop meaningful approaches that reflect the person's individualized needs and interests. The investment of time and energy to assess the person and the situation is well worth the rewards for the person, family members, and staff caregivers alike. Understanding the person and what factors need to be considered to develop a person-appropriate plan of activities is important for all members of the care team. Although each team member has a different role in implementing the plan, success often relies on cooperation between team members and understanding this person and his or her current abilities and needs. To help you put this information into practice, please complete the Part 2 Workplace Exercise included in your handouts. Additional information and resources related to this part of the training program can be found in the Part 2 Appendix. In Part 3, we will talk about activity choices and alternatives for people with dementia using the assessment information you have collected.